Hello, I'm Corey Stevens. I'm going to speak on the topic of selecting for varroa sensitive hygiene in honeybees. I'm currently a grad student at UNL working on a master's in entomology. I'm an EAS certified master beekeeper and a honeybee breeder. I've been working with VSH bees for over a decade. I think varroa sensitive hygiene is the best resistance trait set for varroa and various brood diseases that we're currently aware of. I'll share with you a few things I know about it and how to select for it in your own apiaries. If you're a beekeeper, you're likely sick of hearing about varroa mites. I know I am. 99% of the time, beekeepers cannot have a meeting without saying the word mite or varroa. If you're around one for a while, you'll see. Or if you don't know anything about bees and you just want to strike up a conversation, just say, well, how about those varroa mites? Varroa is unanimously the number one threat to honeybee colony health worldwide. And that seems to be undisputed. Varroa parasitize honeybees and feed on their fat bodies and or hemolymph. New research was showing it was primarily their fat bodies. <clears throat> if you see the picture on the right, uh, that's a drone honeybee. And if you look at around its abdomen, you can see kind of some uh, rusty colored ovals. Uh, those are the mites. They kind of place themselves underneath the abdominal plates, and that's where they can feed and access the fat bodies, and they're somewhat protected. Whenever the mites feed, they open up the bee to many different viral and bacterial infections. <clears throat> Some of them are from direct feeding, um, from the saliva uh, of the mite and some of it's just because there's you know you poked a hole in something and it opens it up to secondary infections by drastically affecting colony survival the mite threatens pollination of important food crops uh, managed honeybees are a primary source of pollination for a lot of crops where you know, we may not have enough native bees to support agriculture in that region, and you can easily bring honeybees in to make sure that the crops produce. So even if you're not a beekeeper, <clears throat> varroa can, it's a huge problem. Even if you just like to eat, which that covers most of us. Varroa destructor arrived in the U.S. around 1987. Um, this was in Florida, is where it's widely documented. I did see something in the late 70s where someone had uh, supposedly seen a mite. It was on the East Coast, but most, most people unanimously agree it was around 1987 when it showed up. Around 1995, <clears throat> USDA ARS bee scientists were tasked with breeding a varroa-resistant bee. Um, it didn't take long to figure out what a massive problem varroa were going to be. And so, you know, this is a good call. Uh, ask the scientist if there's anything that can be done or, you know, if there's any strains of bees that have natural host resistance. The scientists did find bees that actually would not allow Varroa to reproduce. They didn't know exactly what was causing this at first, but they did know that they could measure the fact that they were really limiting mite reproduction. The bees that didn't allow reproduction, they called suppressed mite reproduction which is, you know, kind of the obvious answer. So originally they were called SMR. They didn't know exactly what was causing it, but they knew that, that the bees were limiting reproduction. 
SMR was later changed to VSH, or Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. I'm thinking it was another scientist, possibly Marla Spivak, determined that VSHBs were limiting mite reproduction, but that it was a function of hygiene that the bees were actively breaking the mites' life cycle by uncapping and throwing the pupae outside that were infested. What exactly is Varroa sensitive hygiene? Varroa sensitive hygiene is controlled by multiple genes, <clears throat> so it's a trait set. VSH is an additive trait, which is cool because, you know, I think some people think of VSH as a breed of B, but it's not. You can have VSH Russians, VSH Italians, VSH Africanized bees. You can have VSH Carniolans. Basically, any type of honeybee, <clears throat> this can be selected for. So, you know, <clears throat> you hear some people say, well, I tried VSH bees and they blah, 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 didn't build up or weren't productive or, well, that's... That's definitely the case, possibility, but there's no reason we can't have very productive lines of VSHBs. You know, I've seen both. <clears throat> As I mentioned previously, VSH is a hygienic response that spe specifically targets reproducing mites. Worker bees detect reproductive mites with olfactory cues. <clears throat> so that's really crazy. The bee worker bees, when they hit a certain age, when they're patrolling the nest and cleaning and feeding, and they actually detect reproductive mites in brood by smelling. So basically, it's kind of like a, a beagle dog that would sniff out rabbits. You know, they just <clears throat> they have a instinct, genetic instinct, to search for for this and to find it. And once they find it, they uncap it and pitch it outside. If you look at the picture here, this is a frame of some VSH brood that I took. And you can see the purple-eyed pupae with their faces exposed. This is, a lot of people just call it uncapping or recapping. Uh, this is a good, if you see this in your colonies, it's a good indicator that you may have VSHBs, or they may just have a partial gene set. You know, I said, like I said before, it's it's controlled by multiple genes. They may have part of them. So this is a good indicator here. And if you look around the purple-eyed pupae, you'll see some brood caps that are more reddish colored or sunken just a little bit. Um, a lot of those have been recapped, so they opened it up. So, you know, being suspicious of what may be in there, and they ended up recapping it. I guess it passed the test. High rate of uncapping and recapping. <clears throat> and just this alone, I think, is really disturbing for mites that are trying to be left alone in peace to lay eggs and, and raise babies. Um, they're With BSHBs, they're getting constantly harassed. After detection, the pupae are uncapped and removed from the colony. And the stage that this is done at, most of the mites are, you know, the female mite usually lives or will run off, probably try to start over again, but her young that aren't fully developed yet will die. So this effectively breaks the life cycle of the mite. The role of VSH in honeybee integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is a multifaceted approach to managing pests. Uh, it's, it's an intelligent approach to it. Basically, IPM can be used in control of pests and structures, control of pests and crops. I mean, it, the basic rules apply. And most people, if you've 
been around bees at all and, and heard people talk about might washes or thresholds, that's a part of IPM. Pest sampling is done first to determine if action is required. The goal is to not treat if you don't need to. Um, just from an economic standpoint, this is intelligent because, you know, treatments equal increased costs, increased labor, and so you don't really want to do it if you don't have to. And there's other reasons for that as well. If you're constantly treating a pest with a certain chemical to control it, inevitably that pest will develop resistance to that chemical and then you're kind of left scrambling to find the next chemical or something that's effective. So treatment thresholds are established to assess when pest populations reach problematic levels and that sampling is done. Most people agree that alcohol wash is the most accurate method to sample. And then you set a threshold at, you know, one or two or three, I think one's a bit low, 3% infestation rate. And you know that if your bees are starting to hit that, at, especially at certain times of the year, especially early in the year, um, you can kind of predict that the levels are going to go beyond that and a treatment may be necessary. So establishing thresholds are a big piece of that. Prophylactic chemical applications are a short-term fix with many trade-offs. So as Tom Sowell said, there are no solutions, only trade-offs, and I think that applies to pretty much everything in life. Prophylactic chemical applications, they do, they will remove the pest temporarily off the host to kind of give it some relief. You know, it, it makes sense, <clears throat> but you've got to look at the trade-offs as well. So if you're, like I said before, if you're constantly treating something with a chemical, you're going to be in jeopardy of creating resistant mites, which is a huge problem. Um, you've got to pay attention to the labels because there's always risk of contamination of, you know, comb, which has long-lasting negative effects on your bees. Um, there's always a chance of contamination of honey, God forbid, or, you know, like I said, wax products even. You know, if you're using, if people are using wix, uh, wax to make lip balms, you know, you don't want, you don't want uh, any measurable levels of pesticide in there, obviously, or at least I don't. <clears throat> the holy grail of any IPM system is host resistance. So basically, if you don't have host resistance, you're going to be locked in the prophylactic chemical treatment regime. There's no way to get away from it because your your host or your what you're trying to protect, you know, whether it be crops or whether it be bees, in this case it's bees, they can't defend themselves. So there's there's really no way to get away from chemical treatments if the bees can't do anything for themselves. Without host resistance, like I said, prophylactic chemical ap applications are the default and there's no way to get away from that. And once you get stuck in that, of course, you're going to develop host or uh, pest resistance because of the constant selective pressure from those chemicals. VSH is the most powerful honeybee genetic resistance mechanism known to date. <clears throat> There's some cool ones out there, too, that would be worth selecting for. You know, a lot of people have heard of Purdue mite biters or ankle biters. Those are aloe groomers, and the bees will dance around if they have a mite on them, and their nest mates will groom it off of them. So that's quite useful and, and interesting, interesting set of genes that are effective against Varroa to some degree, but I think that VSH is the most straightforward because it addresses the root cause, which is reproductive mites, and high VSH lines will allow zero mite reproduction. Also, since they're hygienic, you won't see chalk brood, you won't see American fowl brood. A lot of these brood diseases that plague honeybees basically go away. The bees handle that on their own.
What to expect? I expect good brood patterns. Um, you can see this is a breeder queen on the right that I inseminated and wintered and we raised lots of daughters off of her. And I have several like her as well. Um, I do hear some people say, oh, my VSH had bad brood patterns. They were too hygienic. Whenever I hear that, I immediately think that they had crap queens. Um, VSH, in the early days of the breeding program, this was late 90s, quite some time ago, they had a few that were weird and would be kind of too hygienic or something else going on with them, but they were cold from the program and it corrected itself. So whenever I hear somebody say their bees are too VSH, I'm usually immediately skeptical and just think that their queens are trash and need to be replaced because I've seen way too many bees that test at 100% VSH that have amazing brood patterns. Now, of course, this could vary with infestation rates too. So if you, you know, are around somebody that uh, has high mite loads in their bees and your bees are robbing theirs and they're bringing them home, um, you know, you might see those VSH bees ripping some brood up to, to fix the issue. I mean, there's always exceptions, but overall you should expect good brood patterns. Increased colony health. Um, whenever I started using VSH stock back in the day, I, ha I used to see chalk brood. I used to see parasitic mite syndrome. Thank God I never saw American fowl brood, but most of those problems went away or were drastically mitigated just by using high VSH expressing stock. I would go through colonies and find well, sorry for all these acronyms, deform wing virus. Basically, whenever you look at your bees, um, you see the bee, worker bees on the right here, everybody's wings look normal. If you see workers that have withered wings, their wings look like two little pieces of yarn. They're never going to fly. That's deform wing virus. Whenever I would find one of these colonies, I would kill the queen replace the queen with a VSH daughter from a breeder like the one you see on the right. And within six to eight weeks, you would not see that anymore. It would completely vanish. And that's without I wasn't uh, applying chemical miticides because I wanted to see what they were capable of and what they could do or just with genetics alone. And it would completely clear up. Like I can't even find it in my apiaries now. And they're untreated test apiaries. So very cool. I knew they had some type of viral resistance mechanism, but I didn't know what it was. Drastic reductions in brood disease issues. I'm in a very humid area in southeast Missouri where my test apiaries are. And I used to see chalk brood to a fair degree with a lot of commercial queens once i switched to vsh i haven't seen a single cell of it since then and that's over a decade ago so they they completely take care of that you're going to see significantly lower mite loads as compared to non-vsh stock significantly if they're limiting or completely not allowing mite reproduction. Your bees are still gonna get mites, you know, from drift or robbing other feral or neighboring colonies. So you, you could even find some that got higher mite loads if they really are in a high pressure area, but overall, they're not gonna have higher mite loads because they're not gonna allow any of those mites to reproduce. If you've got pure VSH bees or very, very high expressing VSH bees, they will allow zero reproduction. So the levels will fall, they'll die off. They'll go down on their own, even if you don't treat them. Uncapping, recapping, that picture I showed you a couple slides ago where you can see the purple-eyed pupae and kind of see where some of the caps are a little darker or sunken a little bit around them. It's from recapping. You'll start to see more of that. 
Some VSHBs work over drone brood quite effectively. They originally only did VSH assays in worker brood because it's a lot more available. You know, it's it's easy to measure. But on the flip side, I've seen loads of them that work drone brood just as effectively throw drones outside if it has mites in it. That's extremely useful because mites are more prone to go to drone brood because of the longer incubation period. So if whenever they're working over drones, just like they do workers, this has a huge impact on, on mite loads. Deform wing viral analysis. <clears throat> this I, I mentioned earlier that if I saw parasitic mite syndrome, I would have just replaced the queen with a, a one from a VSH line and that it would go away. And then I said, made the bold statement that I don't see it anymore, period, in my apiaries. So there's some form of viral resistance mechanism. I didn't know what it was, but I, it's obvious that it's there. Randy Oliver, some time ago, asked for samples. Um, if I remember correctly, he was wanting uh, some from treatment-free apiaries as well, or some that no miticides had been used. And I think it's probably so they could go, oh my god, look, look at all the virus we found in, in these nasty, untreated colonies. But it was weird because the, act, the complete opposite happened. And I was interested in submitting samples just because of what I'd seen, and I knew there was some level of deformed wing virus. Uh, viral resistance and VSH lines. So I sent him some samples that he asked for, <clears throat> and they were in turn sent to the University of Salford, Manchester in the UK, where they did viral analysis. And if you know anything about deformed wing virus, there's at least three known strains. They just call them type A, type B, and type C. So they were screening and quantifying all three types. Despite being untouched by chemical acaricides or miticides for several years, the total infection of the apiary was extremely low. And you can see on um, this is a part of the document that was sent back to me. Samples were, which were extremely low in deformed wing virus fell outside the quantifiable. These results were marked as BL. So type A, BL, type B, BL, type C, negative. So my total infection was listed at very low, which isn't surprising because like I said, I, can't, I couldn't see it anymore. There, there's one good paper I was reading that, was, that stated VSHBs were really effective at throwing out high viral load pupae with Varroa destructor virus. That got me to thinking. If they're throwing out high viral load pupae for Varroa destructor virus, I wonder if they could be doing that with deformed wing virus. Because I, I was trying to think of what exactly this resistance mechanism that they have is. And the paper also said, that particular one, that they do not throw out deformed wing virus high viral load pupa, but I think they were incorrect there. I think that's what is going on is actually these bees are detecting high viral load pupae and throwing them out. There has to be some way that they're managing high viral loads. And I, I really do think that that was it. More research necessary on that. If you're going to select for VSH, you need a few things. It's not a lot really, but you, there's a couple things here that will make it a lot easier if you're going to test a colony or multiple colonies for VSH. A pair of fine forceps or just a pair of small pointy tweezers. A magnif magnification device. You can see in the picture here, this is Aaron Mullins, a friend of mine, helping me VSH test breeding candidates. Uh, my wife had these little, I don't know what you call them, it's like an articulating magnification 
lamp that has an LED halo light on it. She managed a preschool, and so they would use these to make sure the kids didn't have head lice, and a light bulb came on in my head that, hey, these would be great for uh, doing VSH tests. So <clears throat> you don't have to have these. You could have just a standard magnifying glass and a bright light, but it's kind of nice because you can have two hands with these, and you don't have, you know what I mean? They're, they're handy. They're not incredibly expensive either. You'll definitely need supplemental lighting so you're not overlooking mites whenever you're pulling the brood out. You need a frame of brood with workers that are beginning to emerge. You want them as mature as possible to give the mites every possible chance to reproduce so you're getting solid measurements. And they're easier to pull out when they start to harden. <clears throat> a grafting frame holder is handy but not required. These wooden frames that you can see the is holding the brood frames that's what those are there's a little tray you can't see it in the picture but right below it that's attached to it it's where people put their cell bars to graft into but those are handy as well because you can stack your pupae there i like put them in groups of five so i can count how many i've got because you're going to have to quantify it you've got to do at least a hundred and it's way easier to count them that way You'll need a simple record sheet so you can record your findings. I, it, you know, he may be a special individual, but I can't remember what I had for breakfast the day before at times, so there's no way I would remember what score went with which hives, so you need a, a way to record that. Preparing to VSH test colonies. <clears throat> this is my wife, Jamie, here. Helping, helping me out, getting ready to do some testing. All colonies to be tested must be marked with unique numbers and or letters. That's just so you can mark the frame and know exactly what score goes with who. You can see down here on the entrance of the colony, there's a little disc right there. I use little aluminum tree tags that have numbers stamped on them. I just screw them to the bottom board. And it's, it's best that way because if you screw it to a hive body and it dies or you move it around or transfer it to something or shuffle it, you know, it starts to get stupid, start to lose track of it. So if you put it on the bottom board here, that's, that's, that's the best way from what I've seen. Be sure your queens that you're testing are laying in their colonies for at least six weeks to get an accurate score. It has to be their workers whenever you're testing them. <clears throat> and they only work, VSH works in a certain age range, and so your queens have to be in there at least six weeks. The longer the better. Most of these queens have been in there, you know, this was early April, I believe, and they were from the previous year. So they've, they've been in there, you know, quite some time. Test colonies are inspected to find brood frames suitable for testing. Not all of them will work. You want to find big frames of capped brood, <clears throat> and then you can kind of scratch the caps off to see how what the pupae look like, because you're going to want them as mature as possible, at least starting past the purpleide stage where they're starting to get a tan coloration to them, and right up into emergence. If they're dark colored, even better. So if you find there we go. If you find brood frames with workers that are already starting to emerge, you're, you're good. You're going to find plenty. As I mentioned before, ideal age pupae are starting to pigment. So if they're purple eyed, where they're just white, with purple eyes, they're going to be too soft to really pull out. They just kind of come apart whenever you're trying to take them out of the cell to examine them. So you want them to be past that just a bit and if they've got a bit of a tan coloration to them those are ideal like i said right up until they're coming out those work too whenever you pull the frame out mark the frame with the colony number so you know where it came from and you know brush all the bees off so you don't have them buzzing around the lab we usually put them in a nuke box to transport them back to the lab 
Um, usually I'll brush them off again outside because you may still have a few clingers or nurse bees that are still coming out. And then you can take it inside the lab for testing. This is a photo of a reproductive mite. <clears throat> you can see mama mite here. You can see daughter, you know, it looks just like her mom, but she's not completely developed yet. She's light colored. That's a female. There's a male. There's a male. And that may be another egg. So if you don't bother this mite, whenever the worker bee is beginning to emerge, this she will have already mated with one of the males. And she'll be ready to go find a cell and reproduce. <clears throat> so whenever you're doing a VSH test, you're, you're counting the number of reproductive mites versus the number of non-reproductive mites. So this is, if you see this, that's definitely reproductive. I mentioned previously, if you see pupae in the purpolide stage, they need to age a bit more. It doesn't take long, you know. Six or eight hours will make a big difference. So sometimes if you pull your brood frames, I think John Harbo, Dr. John, the godfather of VSH, I think he even sometimes puts them in the nukes and then tests the following day. So, you know, that is an option. You can see here, this one's got a bit of coloration to it compared to this one here that's just white, and that's perfect. You want them that old or older. They're easier to pull out. They're easy to see the mites on. And that's what you're looking for. My friend Erin Mullins, I had a picture of earlier. This is a little time lapse she took of us doing VSH essays. And you can see her using the fine forceps, the little pointy tweezers. It just makes it way easier to to pierce the cap and to see what you're what you're getting and to pull it out. The goal is to remove and examine 100 to 200 pupae per, per frame. <clears throat> if there's usually 100s adequate, but if you've got really low mite loads or you don't find any mites you're going to want to double the sample size and go to 200 to get an accurate score. So if you don't find any mite, any mites reproductive or otherwise in 200 brood cells, they, they'll they assign a score of a 4, which is as high as you can get. That's basically 80 to 100% VSH. <clears throat> 100 is usually adequate to get a score. like you saw Aaron do here, just pierce the cap with your forceps. Make a circular motion. That'll let you see really, really well if your pupa is old enough, and if it is, it'll allow you to grab it easily. Now, if you look here, <clears throat> side topic here, see how some of those cells right here are a bit kind of sunken looking? Those have been uncapped and recapped. Remove the pupae. As soon as you remove it, look down into the cell and make sure there are no mites, female, you know, female mites down in there, so you don't overlook them. And then check out the pupae. Examine the body of the pupae and the brood cell for mites. Record the number of single female mites you find, that would be classed as a non-reproductive. If you find mama mite, no babies, it's a non-reproductive mite. And then log any female females with babies, like you saw in the picture previously, where there's a female dudonymph or a young female mite, and then males as well. If there's, if they have, you know, at least one female, young and at least one male young that's reproductive
<clears throat> scoring your VSH assay. If your sample has five or more reproductive mites in a hundred pupae sample, there's there's no measurable VSH. <clears throat> They're letting the mites have a reproduction free for all in there, which is the majority of of bees in the US right now, unfortunately. If you find three to four reproductive mites in a 100 pupae sample, you're given, the colony is given a score of one. That's pretty low. There, you may have a little bit of measurable VSH, but I think in one of Dr. John Harbo's papers, I think it said on average there's about 20% non reproductive mites naturally, even if the bees aren't messing with them. So, it's questionable whether you actually have any VSH in there or not. If you find one or two reproducing mites in 100 pupae, the score, the colony receives a score of two. So there is some level of VSH in there. It's not real high frequency, but <clears throat> there's a little in there. There's hope. Finding zero out of 100, like I said, if you don't find, if you find zero mites, period and 100 pupae, it's best to go ahead and do another 100. If you find one reproductive mite out of 200, the colony receives a score of 3. So you've got some level of VSH in there, fair amount. If you find zero reproductive mites out of a 200 pupae sample, or if you're just finding nothing but non-reproductive mites, which is actually better, you know, you can find five mites in a 100 pupae sample, if there's no, if 0% of them are reproducing, <clears throat> that's 180 to 100% VSH. That's what you're after. Very, very high level of expression. They are just shutting down mite reproduction. This is a picture of one of my breeder queens I instrumentally inseminated a few years ago. You can tell, like I said before, she's got a really good brood pattern. You, sh you shouldn't have to sacrifice brood pattern to have high VSHBs. The score assigned to each colony estimates its level of VSH expression. If a colony score is zero, the bees have no VSH alleles, no VSH genes. If a colony scores four, which is as high as you can score, it suggests the bees have all the alleles needed for VSH. <clears throat> the colony score is used to evaluate both the queen from the colony you tested and her drones. Because drones are, are unfertilized so they're a recombinated set of their mother's DNA. So they're, you know, almost, they're not genetically identical to the queen, but they're very close. A score is permanent and stands as long as the queen lives. So you don't have to keep retesting her to see if she's still VSH or not. It's, you're, it's all or nothing. You got it or you don't. The highest scoring colonies deemed acceptable should be prioritized for both queen and or drone production. Queen rearing, my favorite topic. <clears throat> queen should be reared from the highest favorable colonies with the highest VSH assay scores. So in my selection process in my breeding operation. I have, I work my bees, I take them through, you know, an entire season. They don't, they aren't candidates until they've at least lived a full year or more, multiple years. But I want them to be productive. I want them to be gentle because I don't work, I don't like to work with gloves. You know, if you're clipping or marking queens or doing fine detailed work, record keeping, it's a pain in the butt to do that with a pair of heavy work gloves on. It's like doing arts and crafts with, you know, heavy leather gloves. So there's obviously other selection criteria aside from VSH. 
that goes into producing favorable bees and VSH is actually the last hurdle that I put my bees through. So after everything's cold, you know, everything has gone through winter, it's hardy, it's dependable, it's productive, then the last measure is, is VSH assay. High scoring colonies should also be used for drone producing colonies. That spreads the genetics around. Requeen, this is my number one management approach here. Requeen susceptible colonies with F1 queens from high scoring colonies. So if you find poor brood pattern, they're not building up in the spring, they have a potential brood disease issue, they're extremely defensive, whatever, you know, you're seeing parasitic mite syndrome or withered wings immediately that queen's a cull so replace that queen with one of your queens from your high scoring colonies and you'll start to move your whole population in the right direction you're going to really start to gain levels of mite resistance <clears throat> if you're making splits for increase or you're making up nucleus colonies raise queens from your high vsh scoring colonies and queen all those nukes and and new colonies with queens with proven resistance. You don't have to have instrumental insemination to build VSH in your population. <clears throat> it does help. I, it absolutely helps because it takes the variability of open mating out of it. It gives you mating control. So, you know, if you if you have a bunch of colonies that score four and you raise queens from the fours and you catch drones from the fours and inseminate the queens and keep doing that, I mean, you immediately have whatever you produce is going to be fours. You know, so it, it's easy to keep that frequency in the population. And since drones don't have a father, only a grandfather, if you're raising queens from instrumentally inseminated high VSH breeders, it doesn't matter what your daughter queens mate with because 100% of the drones that they produce are going to be VSH carriers. So if you buy a VSH breeder from someone and you raise a thousand queens out of it and you have all these daughter queens in your various apiaries, they are producing a literal flood of VSH drones in your apiaries. So that's going to affect your feral bees positively. It's going to affect your neighbor's bees if they're coming over, you know, and, and mating with your drones. You're, you're going to actually change the entire area in a positive way. So instrumental insemination, like I said, not everybody needs to have it, but it is extremely useful if you're trying to introduce VSH into your, your operation. That's what I did. I just bought VSH breeders from Tom Glenn and it completely, my apiaries did a 180 degree turn. It was, I'm, I'm truly impressed with it. Obviously I've been messing with it for 10 years, so. Thank you. I don't know if you may have any questions. You're welcome to email me, stevensbco at gmail.com. I used to just take a lot of phone calls, but it got to where my wife was giving me dirty looks because I was constantly on the phone talking about bees. And so <laughs> it's best to email me. I've got a YouTube channel that I post educational content on interviews with people that I think are doing cool things in beekeeping and have something worth worth hearing. And you can find me on YouTube, stevensbeeco.com. I have a website. Oops, sorry. YouTube's Stevens Beeco. Sorry. I have a website, stevensbeeco.com. Um, I'm getting better. Or I will get better too about putting blog posts out there. There's there's stuff on introducing queens, why you would want to use VSH, uh, useful things like that. Queen rearing, 
things of that nature. And we do sell BSH breeding stock as well. Instagram, Corey Stevens 00 or Stevens B Company. I'm on Facebook too, so you can find me on there. Message me if you have questions or feedback on queens you've bought. Here's some cool papers that I would recommend checking out. Basically all about VSH. You could t I mentioned John Harbo earlier, he, and I mentioned that he's the godfather of VSH. It was him and Roger Hoop and Garner that found VSH and documented it. Jeff Harris joined shortly after to add to the research. So anything that these guys have written, like these papers here, really interesting information in it. If you want full assay instructions, which you probably will, if you're going to do assays, it's nice to see the total picture. I gave you the shortened version of it, but if you want the full assay instructions, you can find them at this website here, harbobcompany.com. And he still sells breeding stock as well, instrumentally inseminated breeders, and they test fours. They're consistently 100% BSH. I've tested multiple lines, and just because someone says it's VSH doesn't, it's apples to oranges sometimes. A lot of them don't test very high at all or, or have been so watered down it's not even VSH anymore. It used to be, maybe. <clears throat> so now you know how to check and see exactly how VSH your queens are and find those instructions at this website. I hope this was useful and thank you for your time.